Thank you for tuning in today. This is another one of Blandon's Art Talks, where we're talking with um, artist Brendan Hoffman uh, about his exhibit, Brotherland, A War in Ukraine. Uh, the exhibit is located in the East Gallery here at the Blandon Art Museum. We've got wonderful uh, exhibits going on in all the other gallery spaces, plus a brand new one that went up this week uh, with Jamie Brewmeister, It's Not About Me. Uh, we'll be uh, doing, conducting that interview here this week, and it'll be posted on our Facebook page and our YouTube. Um, but, but today we were, we'll be talking with uh, Brendan Hoffman, who is um, actually in New York currently, and so we zoomed in and had a conversation, and I'll kind of turn it over to that. So, Well, hopefully all has gone well for you the um, last couple of days, so you're glad to be back in the United States for a little bit, or... Yeah, it's, I mean, it's been a rare opportunity as of late. My plan for 2020 was to spend more time in the U.S., but yeah. <laughs> it didn't quite work out that way. So, so yeah. you, were, you were over there when the pandemic hit, and so you got kind of locked down over there. Is that what happened? Well, yeah, I had I'd actually been in the States, um, in Iowa, of course, um, for the months leading up to the pandemic, and just happened, that's when I finished my work here and flew back in mid-February. Okay. And so I was in Ukraine. I mean, it wasn't so much that we weren't allowed to leave. The lockdown was never really that strict. It was yeah. just inadvisable. Okay. So, I mean, that was, that was gonna be like my follow-up question. It's like, how, how did they treat the pandemic and how did they, um, you know, lock things down or didn't lock things down over there? It, I mean, it, the early days, there was a pretty strict lockdown. They closed all the, you know, public transportation and things in Kiev. A lot of the shops were closed. Um, but that eased in May of last year. Okay. And then we really never peaked in the, you know, in the early days the way the U.S. and a lot of other countries in Europe did. Yeah. So the peak in Ukraine was not until this year, this spring. Mm. So we had another pretty long lockdown, about six weeks from late March until early May. Okay. And now things are much more under control. The vaccine rollout there is, it's pretty slow, but it's happening. Yeah. So it's getting better. Did you, did you see any major, like, did you know anybody that got really sick from it over there? Uh, yeah, I had a, a number of friends who, who got sick. Um, none in the hospital or anything like that, but um, you know, had a pretty rough go of it. Um, my girlfriend is Ukrainian. Her grandmother um, got sick and, and went in the hospital, but more as a precautionary thing. Okay. Um, you know, she was 83, but <clears throat> she came through it just fine. Yeah. Well, that's good. Um, yeah, pretty lucky overall. Yeah. Yeah. My wife had it and she was down for about a week, but then, you know, yeah. she still can't taste or smell anything. Oh, boy. Yeah. So it's been. I had, I had it in. Um, the one time I left Ukraine last year was to go cover um, the outbreak of this conflict in the Caucasus between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Yeah. Uh, Nagorno Karabakh, and I managed to pick it up there because it was just impossible to to take any precautions when you're in that type of situation. But it yeah. was really mild. Like I just kept working. I didn't know I had it. It was so mild, and I just kept working. So got lucky That's, with that. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, we'll start in here, sorry. Yeah, let's talk about the- uh, <laughs> Little segue. Everybody uh, wants to hear about that stuff. <laughs> well, it's 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 current events, and so- Yeah, it I is. Think, yeah. I think everybody kind of wants to know, especially you know, for you having the experience of being outside the United States and in yeah. a different country and just hearing um, you know, how, how different areas treated it, and you know, because that's going to be the discussion, how different locations treated it different, or you know, when about yeah, and to understand what you know what worked, what didn't. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, well, we'll start off with the first question here. You know, talk about yourself and uh, specifically, you know, kind of about your background. Mm -hmm. So, um, been working as a photographer and more specifically photojournalist and documentary photographer for about fifteen years now. Um, I'm originally from upstate New York, but um, started my photography career in Washington, D.C. Okay. And which was a really great place to, to be. Uh, you know, I've always been a freelance photographer 
um, you know, working for, for different newspapers and magazines and news agencies. And so Washington, D.C., of course, has news happening every single day. And that was a great place to begin my career and get some real world experience and make connections in the industry. And after six or seven years of doing that, I was sort of looking to expand my my practice. And, you know, instead of I'd always been interested in global issues. And so instead of photographing politicians talking about what's happening somewhere else in the world, I wanted to spend, you know, time seeing those things with my own eyes. That's kind of the, the interesting part of my job is to be able to go to these places and, and see all of this happening and talk to people myself and really, you know, understand these places and issues through firsthand experience. So I moved to Moscow in 2013. Okay. And that was uh, only a few months before the revolution in Kiev, which started in late 2013. Okay. So I was already sort of in the, that general part of the world and made it pretty easy to, to travel to Kiev uh, when that started to cover it. And yeah. that was my introduction to working in Ukraine. Okay. So were, have you always been interested in photography or did that come later? I mean, talk about your kind of educational experience or your, your passion for either, either journalism or for mm -hmm. uh, photography. Yeah, I've, I've like, you know, I've always been interested in the visual arts. So, you know, as a kid, even I really loved to draw. Mm -hmm. um, my first exposure to photography was in high school, taking, you know, just a standard black and white photography class, which I, I really enjoyed. And I probably would have continued in college if I hadn't ended up at a university that had zero photography classes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't, I ended up studying art history. Okay. Um, not photography specifically, which was instructive. Um, obviously, you're exposed to, you know, the whole range of, of ideas and artists and, and visual styles and, and certainly somewhere that had an impact on understanding, you know, light and composition and color and things like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've never actually formally studied photography. It just was out of, out of college. It was a, a hobby. Yeah. You know, it was the very early days of digital. And so it was, you know, it became cheap and easy to sort of just like take a lot of pictures and make a lot of mistakes. You're not paying to develop film or anything. So that was sort of how I, I learned it until I, you know, after a few years of, of working, decided, you know, I really think I'd rather just be a photographer. Yeah. So did you take any journalism classes or anything at college? No. No. Okay. No, that, that, that sort of interest and knowledge i i can't even explain it just sort of was like it just sort of was like something i intuitively understood and knew that i wanted to do yeah um just to, you know it was it was a natural thing for me to sort of like slot into that specific okay. you know style of photography yeah well i think it's great you know it's interesting to hear that you have an art history background because i do think the images show you know, that you fully understand composition and structure of the image. And um, and I think that's what helps bring a little bit more power and energy to your your in, uh, your images, not only the content, but the way you're framing them and um, how you're composing the whole image, I think is really uh, um, fantastic, so. Thank you, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of look at photography as a language in a way, the mm -hmm. same as any other language. There's a vocabulary and a grammar and, you know, you, you're using these tools to structure your ideas and communicate them. And one of the amazing things about photography is like, unlike other languages, this is the language everybody understands to some degree. Now you can, of course, you know, become more fluent, but everyone, you know, regardless of background and culture will, will be able to, you know, on some level understand what you're trying to say. Yeah, well, and I, I think too, you know, I always say that art is universal language. But, you know, images, people can identify and um, relate to images that they, they see. You know, that was yeah. one thing that uh, I would, I tell visitors as they come into the museum, you know, when I started um, setting the exhibit up, pulling some of the images out, there's, a, there's one image that I referenced with the, uh, the girls in the bathroom uh, mm -hmm. getting ready for the day or whatever. 
Um, and then there's another one with a, a, a daughter and a mother in a, in a bed. And, um, you know, I pulled those out. It's like, well, those could be my three girls getting ready in the bathroom. Right? It's like, I guarantee my girls had some form of pajamas that looked very similar to at least one of those. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the bedroom with the mother and the daughter, it's like, that could have easily been, you know, my daughter's bedroom with all the stuffed animals and, the, you know, and everything. So um, it was, it was that for me, that was how I kind of related to those images and brought a little bit of a, a sense of humanity to them. And, and it kind of bridged the gap between my experiences and their experiences and brought them kind of closer. Um, and I think it was just the power of just seeing the images and being able to relate to them, you know, so. Yeah, and sometimes sometimes the images can be very direct and sometimes they're a lot more, you know, abstracted, but that's the nice thing about, an, uh, you know, an exhibition as opposed to trying to just click through on a website to look at these is that you, you're able to appreciate a lot of the details, I think. Yeah. more easily and you see some of those little little items in the room that that might connect you with the with the situation yeah well and also too that within an exhibit you have uh, the ability to cross-reference um and have a dialogue between mm -hmm. uh, this image and that image yeah and at yeah. least it, for us it helps kind of communicate the story or communicate what is happening here and trying to bring people closer to that experience so um Let's see. Um, this is kind of a straightforward question. So, uh, what does your work aim to say, or what do you want people to see and feel and learn? Well, if we're talking specifically about the the work from Ukraine that that's up now at the Blandin, um, you know, there are obviously several different things happening. Um, one is I want people to sort of just see the realities of of what's happening mm -hmm. with the situation in Ukraine. Um, you know, of course, it's been in the news for a number of years, but, um, you know, in, in recent years, the situation there has really not changed at all. And yeah. so kind of by definition, it's not really news anymore. And so people are still asking me, you know, like, oh, I didn't realize it's still happening because, you know, I don't read about it or hear about it. But, you know, I want people to be able to see in maybe more of a complete way. Um, based on my experiences, kind of what's happening there. That's one, that's one goal. Um, but beyond that, I want them to maybe understand in a, in a way that, that the world can be very nuanced. And, you know, we as human beings, I think this is a, a, a tendency that we all have, that we, we want to simplify things and, and we want to know, okay, who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, what's right, what's wrong. Okay. And, you know, of course, in, in the context of Ukraine, I think there is, in a way, there's very clearly like one side that has been the aggressor and one side that's been victimized. But when you get down on the ground, um, the people that are that are dealing with this are, it's not a monolithic group. You know, there are people of all different persuasions, all different backgrounds. Um, who are being drawn in for all different various reasons. And it's that sort of nuance and the complications and uh, the gray areas that I think are important to acknowledge. And so we have to kind of fight against that tendency to want to simplify things beyond how simple they actually are. Okay, yeah. Uh, that has been one of my big personal takeaways and I guess like on a on a different level still a third a third takeaway we in the United States have not had to experience war firsthand most of us yeah um, certainly not you know in our own country um, as a result we tend to maybe again have like an oversimplified understanding of what that means and we think of war as either being all consuming or it's not happening. Yeah. When in reality, it again, it's this sort of gray area that you can kind of almost be in a war and not necessarily know it or not necessarily always feel it. Um, it can, you know, normal life carries on even when there's a war happening. It can be a matter of, you know, half a mile this way, half a mile that way. And 
to, to understand that, that war can be much closer than we think, even though life might still feel relatively normal. Yeah. Um, to me, that's like a little bit of a cautionary idea. Well, you even, um, I found one of like an interview you did on, on YouTube. You talked about the fuzziness between war and peace or war and living. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that's something that I try to get across to people as they are looking at the images and saying, it's like, you know, these people are still trying to live their lives, um, yet there's a, a war raging on uh, in close proximity to, to uh, where they're at. Would you yeah, and people are very adaptable. I think, again, that's, that's human nature, but, you know, we, we tend to, like, validate that and think, oh, wow, it's like, you're so resilient, that's great, but... Um, you know, these are things we shouldn't have to adapt to, and it it can swing the other way. People can adapt all too quickly, and and then not take as seriously the the risks to themselves or their families. You know, I've met all these families that live near near the front line, and they have children, and they just are completely, you know, nonchalant about what's happening, and just think that it it can't touch them and it can't hurt them. But of course, you know, that's not true. Yeah. So have you, um, <clears throat> like looking at some of your images, not all of them, but looking at some of them um, and drawing some comparisons to what has happened here in the United States, uh, like in Portland and uh, Minneapolis and uh, some of those areas where we've seen a little bit of like conflict and what we would consider kind of a battleground kind of atmosphere. Um, have you given much thought to the comparisons between like these images and that? And, and if you have, what what message would you like to express to um, viewers? Yeah, I, I have. I mean, maybe less about the images coming out, but the, the sort of background situation. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a little wary on the one hand of sort of using one conflict as a metaphor for another, but at the same time, it's of course, we, we always want to extract lessons. And, you know, in Ukraine, if you had talked to people in this part of the country, you know, the war is happening in this kind of small area, this small corner of the country in the southeast. Yeah. It's not the whole country. But if you had gone to this area two months before there was full on war happening and asked people if they thought that was a, a remote possibility, they would have said no. Hmm. People never believed it could turn into what it what it did yeah and that alone is enough for me to you know think very carefully about what's happening you know particularly in the united states where i think there are of course people who are pushing this conflict and pushing the confrontations uh with this sort of naive view that like well it can't happen here because we've been insulated from it for so long but yeah. I mean, that's the big lesson. Of course it can happen there. It happens in so many other places all the time. Why not? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that to me is, is certainly a frightening thing and, and a parallel that I've thought about. It's more of like a cautionary tale saying it can, it can happen if we're, if we're not vigilant. Yeah, um, it, it can. And it, in, by the time you realize it, it's already too late because like I was saying, you know, it's this, it's this creeping thing that we adapt very quickly and we, we kind of, it, it's not an all-consuming thing all at once, you know. Uh, it, it, it intrudes around the edges until all of a sudden, you know, ship has sailed. Yeah, exactly. Well, and the, you know, the other thing that I, that I at least compare it with, and, and you can tell me if I'm wrong or not, but over here in Iowa, we've got a strong connection to um, Kosovo and what happened in Kosovo. Um, and, you know, Fort Dodge is a sister... Uh, has a sister city in Kosovo of uh, mm. Jokova. And so there has been a kind of a, a partnership between not only Iowa and Kosovo, but even Fort Dodge and Kosovo. Um, and I had the opportunity to travel there a couple of years ago um, and spent a week in, in Kosovo and visiting with people. And, mm. you know, the thing that I, uh, part of me connects with, with the images that are in the exhibit at least, is that some of the buildings that uh, and the landscape that I see in your images are very similar to the buildings and landscape that are seen in like Kosovo. And they went through a major war and conflict. Um, I don't know if it's the, the same um, 
activity in terms of why they went, you know, why the war happened. But I've drawn a little, uh, some uh, comparisons between uh, what's happening in Ukraine and what had happened in, in Kosovo and, and still kind of going on a little bit, not so much the war, but just the, a little bit of conflict and. Um, yeah, of, these tensions for sure, that's the thing is that war in, in uh, the Balkans was more than 20 years ago, right? Yeah. And like you said, there is still tension. Mm -hmm. There are still consequences happening now. Yeah. And that is my big fear with Ukraine too. The longer the, the conflict drags on, the longer it takes to recover from it. Um, you know, of course, people who live in these, um, you know, Russian occupied areas of Ukraine are learning a completely different history and backstory mm -hmm. to the war and why it's happening and who's the bad guy. Yeah. And those are going to be extremely difficult um, perspectives to reconcile if and when there's you know ever some sort of peace agreement and yeah that yeah no matter what the conflict it, it it's disruptive and the and the ramifications echo for a very long time yeah for sure well that kind of relates to another statement that you made too that i found he says as a photographer you are the generator of the first draft of history and yeah so would you say that that's part of your role too as a photographer, especially in the Ukraine, documenting what's happening and making sure that um, the story is being told or at least the images are being shown and so that you can help provide a little bit of context to uh, the narrative that's being uh, created? Yeah, of course, as a journalist, you know, a lot of my work in Ukraine has been for the New York Times, and it's great because they give you a lot of resources and, and the flexibility to just sort of like go do your job um, without actually all that much oversight. And I'm very conscious of the things that I choose to focus on. That's what is going to enter first into the historical record. Um, and that's what people will be you know, pointed towards. But uh, at the same time, you know, I've been thinking a lot about um, you know, what I photograph in terms of, you know, I've been in, of course, in a lot of difficult situations, things that, you know, very gruesome deaths and things like that, where obviously those pictures are not going to appear in the newspaper the next day. Mm -hmm. And it's it's been a bit of a learning experience to, to come around to, to feeling like, you know, maybe those pictures are worth taking, not for their news value, but for their historical value. Yeah. yeah. And that, you know, of course, it, it flies in the face of every instinct you have as a, as a human being to sort of like make those pictures. It feels in the moment disrespectful, but, you know, it is, if you approach it the right way and if you sort of recognize the historical value that these images may have, then, you know, that's that's a an adjustment I've had to sort of make. Yeah, yeah. I could see that being a, a difficult thing, um, knowing and understanding that this is a tragic thing, but it needs to be documented. Otherwise, it, it might not be told. Yeah, you feel like a vulture, you know? Yeah, yeah. But you have to maybe push through that. Yeah. Um, this kind of relates to another question. Um, do you have any, like, um, artistic influences that you utilize, and I'm thinking of not only artists but other um, photojournalists uh, throughout, you know, um, throughout the past. Do you do you reference any of those? Um, yeah, I've always had a hard time like picking out, you know, a few key early influences. I don't know, you know, James Notway, of course, just for his like unrelenting focus and you know the strength of his images aesthetically. Um, and the same with someone like Paolo Pellegrin. Um, more recently, my, my work, it's less influenced maybe by aesthetic considerations than it is sort of like their overall practice and their approach and the ways that they, um, you know, for example, um, there's a photographer, Peter von Ockmel, and his work is really interesting to me in in terms of the balance that he's trying to strike between the aesthetics of the image and the content of the image. Okay. Because this is, you know, this is a constant source of tension as a photographer, as you're trying to understand, you want to make like a, a 
beautiful image on the one hand, um, but that then opens you to, you know, plenty of criticism that you're aestheticizing things that maybe aren't beautiful, you know, you're in a conflict or something. Do you want to make a beautiful image of a war? Yeah. Um, and if not, you know, what, how do you make people look at a picture if it's not beautiful? What, what sort of visual style will, will grab people's attention without, you know, sanitizing the situation? So he's, he's doing really interesting things in that way. Um, there's a photographer, Mark Neville, who's done really interesting work um, documenting communities. You know, he's British and he did work in, I want to say it was in Scotland. Okay photographed a, a town in Scotland. This is a number of years ago now, but uh, after spending, you know, months and months and months, he put together a book of his images. And rather than do the thing that most photographers would do, which is sell the book on the open market to people who can afford to spend money on a, on a photography book, mm -hmm. he, he got the funding to print a thousand copies. Or, well, he printed enough to give one copy of the book to every household in the town. Wow. And that was it. He didn't sell any. He didn't, you know, give them to curators at museums. He just gave them to the people in the town. And ironically, that book, you know, some people were glad to get it. Some people thought it didn't portray the town as well as, as it could have. And they, you know, burned it. But as a result, nobody could buy the book. And it became, as a result, very valuable, which is sort of ironic. But, um, you know, it's, it, it feeds into my, my thinking about who is the audience for the pictures that I'm taking? Mm -hmm. And, you know, experiments like that, I think are really interesting and instructive. You know, I made a lot of my images, of course, for American media and American audiences. Yeah. Um, but obviously the, the audience that has the most um, at stake in this conflict is a Ukrainian audience. And for Ukrainians, especially, you know, I was able for the first few years of the conflict to work on both sides. Um, mm -hmm. I can't any longer enter the, the non-government controlled areas, okay. but Ukrainian media have really not ever had much access to that part of the conflict. And so, um, you know, especially to be able to share images from these places where Ukrainian media can't go with the Ukrainian audience, I think is really important. So yeah. I've, I've tried to, you know, make efforts to, to share the work in Ukraine okay. as a result. Now, when you're over there, you're not only taking images, you, are you getting to know uh, the people? I mean, do you talk with uh, the people that you're photographing or interacting with and trying to understand their stories a little bit better? Um, sometimes, yeah. Uh, often I'll work together with a writer. Okay. And so, you know, the writer is generally the one who will try to sit down and do an interview. Sometimes I'm present for those conversations, sometimes not. Um, sort of the great tragedy of being a photographer is that you can't photograph and have a conversation with someone at the same time. Yeah. And, and more often my, my priority is, is making images. And so I don't get to have as many of those conversations as I would like, but yeah, yeah I do have some. Do you think they do you think the Ukrainians understand what you're doing over there in terms of, uh, you know, documenting this event? The majority do. <laughs> yes, the majority do. It's, uh, you know, there's still a legacy of distrust of, you know, particularly foreigners with cameras, you know, mm -hmm. that you know, dates back to Soviet times and and there's an instinctive like oh you don't need to take my picture you know i'm not important i didn't put on my makeup like all of these things um or people think you're a spy but in reality it's it's almost like a, a reflex more than uh you know their their true honest feeling and as soon as you get to chatting with somebody they almost always open up okay um well good can you maybe kind of talk a little bit about your creative process? You know, how do you start um, developing a project? Um, how does the project develop over time? Um, and do you do any type of research uh, before you go into like an area or, um, or in, you know, building a project? Yeah, well, it depends on the project. So like the Ukraine work, I didn't ever set out for that to be a long-term project in a, in that sense of like a premeditated 
uh, way. So Ukraine, I was just reacting to, to events as they happened. You know, I was there primarily as a news photographer. Um, but in the process of like trying to find the news, you come across lots of other things and you make pictures that might not be like a news picture, mm -hmm. um, but hopefully reveal something a little deeper. But the work, you know, the work that I have now from, from the part of Eastern Ukraine, I'm working to edit that down into a book now, okay. um, which is a real process, but it's the challenge stems, I guess, from the fact that it wasn't ever like, I didn't set out with a structure in mind of how that would look. Um, but that's also given me like a much wider variety to choose from. Okay. On the other hand, I have other projects that are, that are much more structured. So I did a, um, a story that was published in National Geographic last year about the Indus River, which flows from Western Tibet and through Northern India and then down the length of Pakistan. Okay. And so, you know, I've traveled most of the length of that river. And in that case, yeah, there are very specific issues that I was interested in. And then I had to figure out, okay, like this is an important thing to talk about. So how do I, how do I make a picture that, that explains that? Mm -hmm. And that took, of course, lots of research and lots of planning and lots of funding. Uh, so, and now, you know, I have other projects that maybe fit more in that vein where, you know, I have an idea of the, the thing that I think is interesting. And so I have to figure out all the different key ideas and how to illustrate those. Okay. And that involves lots of, you know, books and, you know, academic journals and news reports and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Research is, is interesting, but it can be kind of uh, uh, tedious as, as well. Um, and of course, <laughs> you know, like you can make all of the most detailed plans of how you're going to, what you're going to photograph and why it's interesting. But 50% of the time, the thing you hoped was interesting isn't. And 50% of the time, there's something way more interesting than you ever you know, encountered in your research that's much better than what you thought you were going to get. So, yeah. you know, in the end, the only way to really do it is to get out there and, and, you know, keep your eyes open, have a really open mind, ask a lot of questions. And if something catches your interest, like just pursue it. Yeah, for sure. But they say boots, boots get the boots on the ground and just get in there and, and do it. I am surprised every single time I go on a trip how the secret is just leave your hotel room yeah. like just go anywhere and something will catch your attention and you know so often I find myself in these situations that I never anticipated and it's so interesting and that's still the thing that motivates me and makes me really love to to do what I do so you, you feel like the um the more powerful images are the more spontaneous images maybe often yeah yeah, exactly. Why do you think that is? Probably because my my curiosity and, and wonderment is really genuine. Okay. And I I think in some way I'm channeling that into the into the images. You know, like taking pictures for me. Um, I always say that you know like the, the pictures aren't. I, I I always do stories where I'm genuinely curious and I'm not really sure what to think or how to feel. You know, mm -hmm. and taking pictures that doesn't like answer the questions that I have. They are, they're more of a process of like a record of my search for the answer. Okay. And so the pictures are just like me trying to figure it out. They're not the answer. And probably that's, that's why those more spontaneous pictures while I'm like something like is sparking in my brain, like, Oh, wow, this is new and interesting. Yeah. And I think I think that happens with a lot of artists where the spontaneous nature of, of uh, an act has the highest impact and mm -hmm. often takes people in a totally different direction. And I think that's I think that happens on all in all media. And so, um, yeah, yeah, you know, looking over the last, you know, let's say. 20 years, um, how has your photography um, changed? I mean, I, I'm probably a lot more conscious of what I'm not photographing, if you know what I mean. Um, 
So one example, I guess, is when the revolution was happening in Kiev. Uh, it was extremely visual. Uh, you could just walk out on the street all day, every day. There was like interesting things to see and you know, great pictures to be made. And that was really important to, to document. But at the same time, unless you also contextualize that with the fact that this was actually happening in a relatively small part of the city and that outside of this core area, like normal life was continuing on as always. Mm -hmm. That was a thing that at the time I didn't really put as much emphasis on. And now in hindsight, I think, you know, that could have also been really interesting and important to, to show. And so I think about that too, with the work in Eastern Ukraine and with everything else that photography almost by its nature tends to highlight the exceptional, mm -hmm. which can of course like really memorialize important moments, but it, it leaves us with a false sense of whether that was something that happened a lot or everywhere, or if it was isolated to one specific time and place. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing I think a lot more about now than I did previously. Okay. Um, so in terms of like what you're looking at, uh, future projects, um, where, where do you see yourself going uh, in the next, let's say five years or so? Well, like I said, one of, the, one of my big projects is to take this work from Ukraine and, and make a book out of it. Mm -hmm. And so I've been working on that for about a year, and I think I'm probably still a year from, from publication, but that will be, um, I hope, a really significant milestone. Um, I have another project that, you know, my work in Ukraine has turned me on to this as an idea that I think can be explored outside of Ukraine as well, which is the intersection between armed conflict and the environment. Mm. And the fact that, you know, wars have... Um, a very definite harmful impact on the environment and that the environment itself can be a factor that makes war more likely or for it to last longer or makes it much more complicated for uh, people to resettle and recover from a conflict. Um, so exploring kind of that intersection is something that I, I hope for the next few years can, can keep me busy. Yeah, no, that sounds exciting. I'd like to see more of those. Uh and hear more about that project. I think that's yeah, well, <laughs> working on the funding aspects. Yeah, right good luck now. to you. <laughs> um, let's see, what best uh, piece of advice have you been given? And what advice can you give future um, photographers or artists or journalists? I, I had to think about this one for quite a while, but it, I think the best advice I heard was that you know there are lots of great pictures but not that many good ideas. Mm. And, you know, working in documentary photography nowadays is not just about being able to make a really great picture. Mm -hmm. That helps, of course, but it's so much more about the ideas behind the pictures. And so, I mean, that's driving everything I do now. Okay. It is, you know, from, from the book to, the, the project I just described and everything else, it really all comes back to like, you know, is there something new and of value that I'm contributing to the conversation hmm. instead of just like, hey, look at this cool picture I took. Yeah, yeah. And it, kind of in a related way, the advice that I often give is that people need to become experts. Hmm. Like I, I, in researching this project about you know, the nexus between war and the environment. Like, you know, I want to be as fluent in these issues as anyone with a master's degree um, in, the, in this topic would be and to understand it kind of on that level. Yeah. So that I really know what I'm talking about. I know what's important and, um, you know, I can convince editors and other people that this is important and that I, you know, am able to explain that and really like, find the areas to advance that conversation. Not dealing with a subject at a superficial level, but really kind of entrenched and deep within the full understanding of it. Yeah, and the, sometimes though, like this, this is a topic that I think is right now sort of poised between 
it's a it's an area that you know policymakers and academia are are focused on, but it hasn't it's an idea that hasn't like translated to the broader public yet. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, actually, to to serve the function of being a communicator and taking these sort of like complicated academic thoughts and making them accessible to a wide audience in a way that makes people really pay attention and think about it and understand it. Yeah. Um, that not to say that's superficial, but it it's you know, you can, you can, it's actually sometimes the point is to make it um, a little more superficial so people realize, oh, actually, these ideas aren't that complicated. Yeah. But it seems kind of like, you know, sometimes I talk, there's, there's certain artworks that at least I talk to the general public about being kind of like an onion. And so there's, there's, there's different ways of um, approaching the work. And the more time you spend with them, the more time you uh, the more you know, the layers of the onions kind of start to open up and you can mm -hmm. get deeper and deeper and deeper into the subject. So I think it's just understanding that a topic can be presented to someone in a very simplistic way, but then the more you spend with it, the greater knowledge kind of opens up and develops over time. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. And of course, giving people a, a pretty simple takeaway message of like, oh, like this is now the, the sort of call to action or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a very current topic too. I mean, a lot of people are focused on the environment, you know, and climate control and all that. So I think it's a, an interesting conversation to have um, with, with people. So I think-, uh, I think Yeah, well, right. People are primed for it, but at the same time, it's the, it's the part of the story that in the context of you know, armed conflict, there are always these much, much more urgent humanitarian concerns. And so it kind of always is put in the back. Um, and that is perfectly logical. But at the same time, I think the takeaway is that by, by being aware of these issues and anticipating them and addressing them quickly, we can actually solve a lot of the other uh, humanitarian issues as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one plays right with the other, I mean, yeah, environment. Yeah. That, really that's an idea that I think uh, is sort of new. Yeah. No, I think that sounds. Like I say, I think it sounds like a really great project. So, um, so last question I have for you: What does it mean uh, for you to have your exhibit at the at the Blandin? I really enjoy getting my work. You know, of course, you know, as a photographer, as an artist, there's maybe a history of aiming to, you know, do these exhibitions in New York or Paris and, you know, all of the prestige and everything that goes along with that. But, you know, kind of in line with my thinking about um, audiences, I, I actually really enjoy reaching audiences that don't routinely have access to, to these types of exhibitions and this type of work. Uh, and that is, for me, one of the biggest reasons to to bring the work to the Blandin, mm -hmm. you know, it's not New York, and and there aren't ten exhibitions a week in Fort Dodge that people can go look at. And yeah. we have, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't be able to attend an exhibition like that. For for sure, yeah. No, I think it's great, and and so far it's been um, well received. I mean, people have been coming in; they understand that it's a, a heavy in content. Uh, and they spent a lot of time walking through the exhibit, reading the the short little um, the labels that we have, mm -hmm. and really kind of, and we really try to focus on, um, you know, the the aspect of the humanity aspect and trying to have them relate uh, more so to what's going on and and find connections between what's happening here and and having that moment. It's like, well, this could happen here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I mentioned to you, there's a there's a Ukrainian community just down in Ames. So I've, I've made them aware that this is up now. I hope that, I hope that they come and see you while they're there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So that, you know, these them. are issues that are much closer to the people in Iowa, maybe than most of them even know. Well, and yeah, they, they don't know. A lot of people don't real, probably don't even realize there's a Ukrainian community yeah. uh, in the heart of, of Iowa. So, mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, anything else you'd like to add and uh, to tell, visitors as they come through the exhibit? I feel like we covered uh, a lot of what I wanted to get across, so. <laughs> good. 
thank you very much for doing this. Yeah, no, thank you for taking time with me today. And and uh, um, um, I know people will will be coming in to, to view the work, and you know, and I think they'll they'll come away with a, a better understanding of what's happening in the world. And um, so, thank you again um, for your time, and thank you for sharing your amazing photography with uh, with the uh, with the Blandin and with the community of Fort Dodge. So, my pleasure, and I look forward to being back in Iowa again at some point. Well, sounds good. Well, All enjoy right. the rest of your day, and uh, thank you again. All right. Thanks a lot. Yep.